Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support, please subscribe. Catherine Parr, the Tudor feminist. Now, Catherine Parr is known today for being the sixth wife to King Henry VIII. She survived her marriage to the king, and by the time she died, she had been married on four separate occasions, twice before Henry and once after. But it's not the love life of this queen consort that we are interested in. Instead, we're going to discuss whether or not Catherine could quite possibly have been a Tudor feminist. Catherine was different to all of Henry's other wives. She was much older, and unlike his previous wives, she had not spent a lot of time in royal service. Instead, Catherine is different from all the others through her status as an author. Catherine Parr was the first Queen of England to have her own work published, and although her religious views were quite radical, she has been dubbed the first Protestant Queen of England when Catherine became Queen. When Catherine became Queen, she saw that it was her duty to push forwards with religious reform and show her subjects the teachings of God and speak his words. Catherine was certainly more forward with her interest in religious matters and she became more and more confident in voicing her beliefs, especially through the written word. The Lamentation of a Sinner was written by Catherine in the winter of 1546 and it was described as far more personal than any of its predecessors and contained the Queen's own personal views on religion. What's interesting is that it's believed that Catherine adopted a male persona when addressing the reader of the book. Addressed to all Christians, Catherine detailed the faults of all men which be in the world and condemned contentious disputers, foul gluttons, slanders, backbiters, fornicators, swearers and blasphemers. The Queen assumed a mantle of male identity speaking to the sinful not as a mere woman, but as a ruler, chastising the guilty of both sexes who have deserved her chastisement. Catherine, however, associated Christ with qualities that we usually associate with a woman. She said Christ was innocent, obedient, and his father meek and humble in the heart who came to serve and despised wildly honour. Catherine also, by contrast, referred to herself as being most stubborn and disobedience, most proud and vainglorious. She also said she converted to rule over her brethren. The characteristics in which Catherine was speaking about, however, are typically associated with men. The lamentation contained an inversion of gender roles and attributes that were contemporary, but it's also underscored Catherine's interpretation of her own self-image as one who was set apart by virtue of the position and understanding from her sex and in general from those restrictions commonly imposed on her sex, female in particular. Interestingly though, the idea that Catherine held about what it meant to be queen had a profound influence on Elizabeth, her stepdaughter. The influence on Elizabeth had been seen as having an incalculable consequence for England. Catherine is assertive in her book and it has been interpreted as demonstrating her denial of the contemporary nation of the inferiority of the female sex. But saying that, it would possibly be going too far to suggest that Catherine's inversion of gender roles amounted to a declaration of female equality. You see, Catherine is conformity to contemporary expectations of each gender and can be visibly discerned elsewhere. You see, when Henry, her husband, confronted her in the year 1546, angrily accusing her of lecturing him, she was quickly to placate him. She said, I have always held it preposterous for a woman to instruct her lord. Catherine reassured Henry by saying, I am but a woman, and with all the imperfections and natural to my weakness of my sex. Therefore, in all matters of doubt and difficulty, I must refer myself to your majesty's better judgment as to my lord and head. In her book, The Lamentation, Queen Catherine stressed that her beliefs on the appropriate conduct of the female sex by saying, If they be woman married, they learn of St Paul to be obedient to their husbands, and keep silence in the congregation, and learn of their husbands at home. Also, 
that they were such apparel has become of holiness and calmly usage with soberness, not being accusers or detractors, not given too much eating of delicate meats or drinking of wine, but that they touch honest things to make the young woman sober-minded, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, housewifely and good, that the word of God may not be spoken evil of. And according to Catherine, women should ideally be pious, respectful, chaste, sober, defer to their husbands, be moderate and loving. But with all that being said, contemporaries have celebrated Queen Catherine Parr and praised her virtues which, in their eyes, set her aside from being female. The writer John Fox refers to Catherine as but a woman accompanied with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of her sex, but commented that she was very zealous towards the gospel. And a fellow at St John's College, Roger Ascham, praised that Catherine was an erudite queen and most noble lady, and he referred to her talents and her desire to learn more, and her occupations of her dignity and many of us do in all leisure and quiet. You see, Catherine's virtues and accomplishments were viewed by contemporaries as unusual in that of the female sex, and these may have come to seem threatening to the king, who was reluctant to be beasted by a woman. Catherine was undoubtedly a queen who was passionate and opinionated about what mattered to her. She was learned and resolute and rather outspoken, and these were qualities that were not ideal for a woman of the time and male commentators did not associate the qualities that Catherine had with a lady. Although this video is titled The Tudor Feminist, to label the Queen as an early feminist would be anachronistic. Catherine did certainly encourage women to seek their own salvation through the grace of God alone, and beseech women, alongside men, to disseminate God's word but at the same time, Catherine did maintain that a woman should be submissive and respectful of their husbands, and that they should have children and behave themselves and be modest. By virtue of Catherine's religious beliefs and her exalted position, Catherine valued her opinions and her ideas, and she was not afraid to voice them in the highest of circles. Catherine believed that it was her duty to set out the word of God, and through her publications encouraged others, men and women, to join her mission. But when Catherine married the king, it wasn't out of love, but out of duty. She continued in her discussions of theology, piety, and the right to use the Bible, both with her friends and also with her husband the king. Catherine had established very early on in their marriage that this was a practice they would continue. Catherine was very lucky in some senses, for King Henry VIII had always allowed her a great deal of latitude, and he tolerated her. It was said that he tolerated opinions which no one else dared to utter. In taking advantage of this indulgence to urge further measures of reform, she presented her enemies with an opening. You see, on one occasion, King Henry was irritated and angry with the actions of Catherine, and he complained to Gardiner about the unseemliness of being lectured by his wife. But this was a heaven-sent opportunity for Gardiner, and he, undeterred by his previous failures, hastened to agree, adding that if the king would give him permission, he would produce such evidence that his majesty would easily perceive hell perilous, in the matters, it is to cherish a serpent within his own bosom. King Henry gave Gardiner his consent, and articles were produced, and a plan was drawn up for Catherine's arrest and a search of her chambers, and the laying of charges against her were made. You see, Queen Catherine Parr was against those who criticised reading the Bible, on the grounds that it would lead to heresy. It was in the May of 1543 that the council had decided that the lower class or the lower gentry did not benefit from reading the bible nor should it be read in english the act of advancement of the true religion stated that no woman or any man under the degree of yeoman or under husbandman and no laborers could in the future read the bible either privately or openly and in a sermon in the city of london it was suggested that studying the scriptures was making the apprentices unruly Women yeomen and apprentices 
all led lives that were far removed from the court, but Queen Catherine was apparently in the habit of holding study groups among her ladies for the scriptures and listening to sermons of an evangelical nature. In 1543, an act did then allow any noble or gentlewoman to read the Bible, but this activity must take place to themselves alone and not to others. A plan of attack was then in place by Gardner and his allies on the council, and they planned to attack Queen Catherine through her ladies, and they believed they possessed a valuable weapon in the person of Anne Kime. Anne is better known today through her maiden name, Anne Askew. Anne Askew was a notorious heretic who had already been convicted and condemned, but it is a sad yet interesting example of how often educated, highly intelligent and passionate women who were destined to become the victim of society in which she lived and she was a woman who could not accept her circumstances, and she therefore fought an angry yet hopeless battle against them. It is believed and highly probable that Anne had attended some of the biblical study sessions with Queen Catherine Parr in her apartments, and that she was certainly acquainted with some of the Queen's ladies. But Gardner made it his mission to find this out, and if so, prove that Anne had been in touch with any of the Queen's ladies, and perhaps even possibly the Queen herself. If it could be proved that they had been encouraging her to stand firm in heresy, then the Lord Chancellor would have an ample excuse for an attack on the Queen. So Anne was therefore transferred to the Tower, where she received a visit from Worthsley and his henchman, Sir Richard Rich, the Solicitor General. Anne was brutally ordered to be placed and stretched on the rack. This, however, was not only illegal without a proper authorisation from the Privy Council, but it was also unheard of to apply torture to a woman let alone a gentlewoman like Anne Askew, who had friends outside the world. The lieutenant of the tower therefore hastily disassociated himself from the whole proceedings. The following is an account produced by Anne about her torture in the Tower of London. This account was then smuggled out to her friends and is dated the 29th of June 1546. They did put me on the rack because I confessed to no ladies or gentlemen to be of my opinion. The Lord Chancellor and Master Rich took pains to rack me with their own hands till I was nearly dead. I fainted and then they recovered me again. After that I sat two long hours arguing with the Lord Chancellor upon the bare floor. With many flattering words he tried to persuade me to leave my opinion. I said that I would rather die than break my faith. Anne Askew was then sadly executed after her trial and torture, but her trial, and among others, had raised some theological points, and Queen Catherine Parr dared to contradict her husband, King Henry VIII, who was suddenly very furious. He said, A good hearing it is when women become such clerks, and I think much to my comfort to come to me in mind old days to be taught by my wife, it was then that the king authorised the arrest of his wife. John Fox wrote that Catherine Parr had nursed Henry during his increasing trouble with his leg, that she was a model wife, but she was also a Protestant and an eager reader of the Bible, and often engaged in theological arguments with him, and Henry was urged to send Catherine to the Tower. He pretended to agree and signed an order for her arrest on a charge of heresy. But the king's doctor discovered about the order, and therefore showed it to Catherine. This gave Catherine a head start and she told all of her ladies to get rid of their banned Protestant books, and she then went to Henry, but when he suggested that they should have their usual theological discussion, Catherine refused. Catherine told Henry, I am but a woman, with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of my sex, therefore in all matters of doubt and difficulty, I must refer myself to your majesty's better judgment as my lord and head. And is that even so, sweetheart, replied the king, and tendered your arguments to no worse end? Then perfect friends we are again, as ever at any time heretofore. Catherine continued by saying that since God, 
therefore has appointed such a natural difference between men and women, and your majesty being so excellent in gift and ornament of wisdom, and I a silly poor woman, so much inferior in all respects of your nature, and to you how then come it is now to pass that your majesty in such difficult in such diffuse course of religion will seem to require my judgment. She explained that she had only argued with Henry in the past in order to have the opportunity of listening to his learned argument. He was very pleased with her attitude. You see, Catherine was a clever woman and she was quick thinking. And the next day came around and Henry and Catherine and her ladies were all in the garden at Hampton Court Palace. An escort of 40 of the King's Guard arrived to arrest the Queen and take her to the Tower. But Henry had a whispered conversation with Rosalie. Most of the conversation couldn't be overheard, but it suggested that Henry called him an arrogant, naive beast and a fool. Rosalie and the guard then departed quickly, and Catherine was saved. Catherine was in fact a very clever lady, who used her position as queen to extend her learnings and beliefs to those who otherwise could not have accessed it. She knew how to manipulate the king to her way of thinking, and when things got rough, she knew how to save herself and tell him exactly what he wanted to hear. Catherine is also noted as doing other things to start the leap in women's progression in the world. She commissioned a woman to paint her portrait. Suzanne Hornbolt is one of three ladies to have thought to have done this for Catherine. Catherine also fought for women and young girls to be educated to the same standards as a man. Catherine had a strong influence on the country's politics. She was the first queen to have published a book in her own name, and she was incredibly brainy and is described as being a dynamic proto-feminist. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to her remarkable history. Thank you.